it's time for us to get out of the dungeon. We're going to be using chapter four of the Tome of Adventure Design to come up with some non-dungeon adventure and encounter ideas uh, rolling up on a bunch of random tables. So let's roll. Hey friends, I'm Brian at Jacoby. Today we're going to take a look at chapter four of the Tome of Adventure Design by Matt Finch. This chapter takes us out of the dungeon and gives us some opportunities to create some random encounters or some random adventure areas that uh, are outside of the dungeon. Uh, as easily as that sounds, uh, that's what it is. If you haven't seen the previous couple of episodes, I'll link to the playlist somewhere here on the screen for you to check it out. Uh, but what we're doing, we're going through the Tome of Adventure Design, chapter by chapter, rolling up a bunch of random uh, encounter ideas and adventure ideas, and putting them into a document that I will harvest and try to put together a cohesive adventure uh, in another video. So take a look at that. Uh, if you want to have a look at the Tome of Adventure Design yourself, there will be links in the description that will take you either to Drive Through RPG or to the Mythmere Games site where you can purchase the Tome of Adventure Design for yourself. This is a really great resource. It uh, helps dungeon masters or game masters who are trying to come up with their own campaign ideas, their own adventure ideas, things like that, by taking a, a bunch of random tables and putting things together. On first glance through things, they can seem rather disparate and disjointed, like things don't quite mesh together. But that's where the genius is. If you have a creative mind and you can take multiple seemingly separate ideas that have no relation and create some relation that, uh, that makes sense for your players, for your campaign, for your table, that's where the magic is. Uh, it helps break out of ruts uh, that we fall into as game creators, game designers, game players, and really throws a bunch of brand new ideas into your game design bag. So I highly recommend it. Hopefully the videos that I've put together here uh, showcase how effective and how much fun this can be uh, putting things together. All right, let's flip you do the screen around and let's take a look at chapter four. So here we go, chapter four, non-dungeon adventure design. So we start out with the types of adventure. What type of adventure or what uh, landscape are we going to be exploring? Whether it's aerial, castles and ruins, cities and settlements, planar or alternate worlds, underwater, waterborne, and wilderness uh, encounters. So I'm going to roll uh, four times on this table to come up with uh, a couple of environments that we'll explore and then I will roll on the associated tables to flesh these ideas out even a little bit more. So the five encounter environments or adventure environments that uh, that I've come up with on my random rolls, we've got underwater, cities and settlements, aerial, planar and alternate worlds, and wilderness. For each of our adventure settings there is an events table. So I've rolled up four times on the underwater events table uh, and if I've come up with mental call or communication with water, crack, water giant, kraken, or other powerful being, the arrival of unintelligent aquatic predators, strange particles or objects suspended in the water, and an underwater vehicle. So those are four events that, uh, that we can dive into a little bit more, dive into, and uh, explore. A little bit later. I know for um, underwater vehicle there's a separate table that we're going to roll on. There is also a table in here for underwater adventures that sort of describe the ocean floor features, so I'm going to roll up a couple times on that uh, just to come up with a couple of features uh, related to the ocean floor. And for our ocean floor features we have shipwrecks, huge predatory anemones, and more shipwrecks. So I'm going to roll up some descriptions of the shipwrecks. I'll roll twice for each of the shipwrecks entries uh, that I came up with on the ocean floor features. That should give us plenty of shipwrecks to play around with. And then later down the road, we'll kind of stat out uh, the predatory anemones uh, because I'm already excited about that. So the four different ships that we've come up with, we've got uh, ship one is a galley and it's reason for sinking, it's not apparent. If 
we really want to come up with a history uh, that could be fun to make it a little bit of a mystery for the uh, players to unravel if that's relevant to the story. Uh, we have a galleon uh, that was sunk uh, by way of crushing damage. So maybe tentacles, a uh, large sea creature has uh, a kraken of sorts, has uh, crushed this thing. Um, ship three is a galleon. And its reason for sinking was that it was wind, uh, blah, it was capsized by wind. And ship number four is a caravel that was burned. And that's the reason that it sunk. Next, we have a table that is all about the inhabitants of these shipwrecks. So for each of the shipwrecks that, uh, that we've created, I'm going to roll up twice just to come up with a couple of uh, sort of basic ideas of what kind of animals are going to be in and around these shipwrecks. So the inhabitants of ship one, we've got sharks or large predatory fish. We have dangerous seaweed or anemones, possibly with a symbiotic organism not affected by the other inhabitants. So that fits in pretty well with our other uh, result of huge predatory anemones. On shipwreck number two, the inhabitants are traps to be emptied, emptied by a monster later. So a, some sort of semi uh, intelligent monster has set up uh, some kind of trap that will keep prey in place and be eaten later. And uh, this fits in pretty well because this galleon was sunk by crushing damage. One of the inhabitants is a giant squid. So it crushed this, uh, this galleon and then took up residence inside. Uh, ship number three, we have a school of predatory fish and a giant worm or annelid. For ship number four, the inhabitants are underwater humanoid type. So mermen, uh, tritons, fishmen, uh, what are they called? Sahawagan. I always never know how to pronounce that uh, properly. Uh, and then we have moving mechanisms. So traps, um, or moving mechanisms, traps, or both that are built into the ship itself before sinking. So maybe uh, some sort of mechanism on the ship uh, now that it has sunk could potentially act as a sort of trap if you know something is dislodged and a cannon uh, sort of wheels itself across the, uh, the deck or something like that. Uh, so there are some options that we can play around with in there. Um, somewhere in here, oh yeah, for ship number one, we had dangerous seaweed. There is a table here for unusual seaweeds, so I'm going to roll on there and just kind of, uh, see what we come up with on this, uh, table. And we get a large growth, uh, that can move similar to a large shambling mound or tree shepherd. I like having this as well as the, uh, the dangerous anemones, um, Maybe the anemones that are in this ship are smaller than the huge predatory anemones that are outside uh, moving around on the ocean floor. And so they create uh, sort of a an encounter where now characters have to be careful about these smaller anemones because maybe they're scattered around on the, the sunken uh, area around the inside of the ship. And also there's this sort of underwater shambling mound. And our next table uh, is for underwater vehicles. So I'm going to roll it here. And what we've come up with is a hot air balloon or a Zeppelin arrangement. I'm not sure how that, uh, I guess, maybe the uh, the balloon acts as a, uh, a sort of ballast uh, to raise and lower the underwater vehicle. Um, interesting. We'll see how that, uh, we'll see what, what comes of that. Uh, as we keep going. All right, the next uh, adventure setting that uh, that I rolled up on my uh, the random tables is city and settlement adventures. And at the very start of this section of chapter four, we have a couple of paragraphs that talk about how city and settlements can become very complicated. And it's important to understand why the party is in the city so that you're not creating an adventure that isn't necessary or, or putting a forcing the, the player characters into a scenario where it doesn't really make sense yet. Um, if they are intent on delving a dungeon and they come back to the city just for some repairs, maybe to get some supplies and stuff like that, it doesn't make sense to 
put them into like, oh, by the way, we need to go steal money back from this noble or, you know, get get uh, revenge on this other uh, thieves guild, things like that. There, there should be a way to tie in whatever is happening in the city, tie it into whatever the adventure actually is, right? So there are, uh, as we go on, uh, we talk about a couple of different reasons that uh, that city adventures happen. There are either shopping trips, missions, or explorations. So shopping trips, coming into town, making sure that you, you can pick up uh, the goods that you need. Maybe you have to go to this town because this is the only place where some arch wizard creates a certain magical item that's required either for the adventure or as payment for some other clue that you have to get from someone else somewhere else. And exploration adventures. So this is where... We come into town and maybe there's, this is just a set piece, right? This is just kind of a, a step along the, the route where there's nothing specific planned and maybe the, the adventurers just want to go out and have a night on the town, explore this town uh, and, and see what's going on. In this case, there are a wide number of options that you can throw at the party, um, you know, different uh, taverns that they could run into. Maybe there's a festival going on. Uh, maybe they accidentally cross paths with uh, what seems to be sort of a street urchin who either gives them a, a, a future prediction or if they have a bad interaction with this street urchin, maybe they get cursed, something like that. So lots of different things that, that, that could happen here. But ultimately, anytime the, the players come into a, a city or a settlement, there should be something memorable about it. Um, you know, maybe they remember that it's the giant metropolis. That's fine. But also, there are going to be a bunch of other little towns and things that, that people come into, that parties come into, that start to blend together a little bit, right? So coming up with some quirk about this town. Oh, this is the logging town. And that's where, you know, uh, a bunch of the, the logging workers had some, uh, some quirk about either the way that they speak. Maybe they use a certain uh, word often, like some sort of slang, you know, things like that, or... or they were wearing a certain kind of uniform, something that helps the players tie, uh, you know, some quirk of the city to some of the events that were happening here. Uh, so we'll get into um, coming up first, the pride of the town. So I'm going to create um, maybe two different towns because there, there are a lot of sub tables in here. So I, I don't want to get too crazy. I'll create two little towns. Uh, or two cities and uh, flesh them out as we go. So up first, pride of the town for the two towns that we're creating. The first city, the pride of the town, is the remarkable fatness or thinness of locals. So that's kind of interesting. We can think about you know, why do they have a certain common body type, uh, stuff like that. For the second city, we have uh, the size or the taste of local vegetables. That could be a lot of fun. Um, so we'll you know, play around with that a little bit. Next, we have uh, tables for unusual domestic animals used. I'm going to skip that one. I'm just going to have uh, this is just kind of a typical fantasy city or town. Uh, so we're not going to have them riding dinosaurs or elephants or anything like that uh, for um, for this series of rules that I'm creating. Uh, and then we have odd customs of dress. I am going to roll up on these because I think that's a lot of fun. Uh, thinking about sort of the uh, geographical fashions and things like that, uh, that's, that's a simple way to add something unique to, to various cities and towns. So I'm going to roll up on here and we'll take a look. Next, we have a couple of additional tables that just give us some other little quirks about the uh, the people or the things that they're doing uh, in these towns. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to roll maybe a six-sided dice, and if I get uh, one or two, then I will roll on the uh, the table that's listed here. Uh, if it's a three through six, then I'm going to skip that particular, uh, that random table, because it doesn't make sense if every town you go to, they're riding uh, or using different uh, different types of domesticated animals. Um, it doesn't make sense. Uh, the next table here, odd customs of dress. Every time you go into a city, it doesn't have to have the same quirks. So I'm just going to kind of create my own ideas or my own framework around like randomly selecting from a couple of these tables to flesh out some of the memorable pieces of these cities. 
the things that we've come up with uh, in First City, there's an odd custom of dress. So all members of a particular guild uh, have a metal collar or a bracelet or other non-decorative piece of metal. Uh, they have odd behavior, they bow constantly, and there's an unusual cultural center of gravity, which is the citizens are obsessively focused on a particular statue in the community. Um, so maybe this represents, uh, maybe the statue is, uh, you know, if we decide that uh, the people of this community uh, are thicker or thinner, maybe that statue represents uh, sort of a, a, a standard of beauty. And so they're, they're obsessed with that. And so that's what they focus on. And maybe there's some sort of curse that's wrapped around that statue. Second city, the, uh, the only thing that, uh, that they end up having is an odd behavior. There's a two-part gesture for greetings. Uh, which can be fun. So we can come up with any number of two-part gestures. Uh, so, you know, maybe they put their hand on their heart and then then wave hello or, or something like that. Um, so just some fun things that solidify uh, something strange about these cities or, or quirks about the city. Not, that, not necessarily that they have to be strange, but just little cultural or uh, little quirks about the cities. Next, we start talking about mapping out our city. And there's a note uh, at the top of this that uh, talks about the author's favorite method of generating uh, city maps, where you start with a central location and then kind of figure out what the flavor of the city is going to be based on that central location. And I think I'm gonna follow that because it makes sense to me. Um, in here it says basically, if you're, uh, the central piece of your city is a graveyard, that's going to have a much different um, sort of flavor of the city, flavor of the people who live there, the things that they do, the way that they might act. That's going to be a much different flavor than if the city were centered around like a courthouse or like a um, sort of uh, ruling classes um, uh, house or castle, you know, something like that. And I think I'll follow that uh, that basic advice. So uh, we're going to start out with uh, sort of what are the uh, the main uh, so on table four twenty five the main open area sort of the central area of the city. So for city number one, our central area is going to be a political forum, and for city number two, we have a market square uh, for the center uh, of the city. Now I'm going to go back and kind of take a look at uh, interesting aspects of streets, uh, city districts flesh out a couple more things for these cities. Now I've come up with a couple of city districts for each of our two cities. So in city one, we have a red light district, um, whether that's uh, supported or not supported, whether it's a series of brothels or something that's um, you know a little bit more professional. Uh, and then we have a wealthy or nobles district uh, that's sort of noticeably separated from the rest of the uh, the rest of the, the city. Uh, for city number two, we have a merchant's quarter, we have a temple district, and then we have some manner of segregation, whether that is uh, based on uh, wealth, whether it's based on uh, heritage, maybe there is a uh, a group of refugee gnomes uh, that, uh, that are currently living in the city and they've taken over or they are uh, choosing to reside in one section of the city. Or maybe it's a little bit more nefarious where the town has decided for some reason that members of a certain religion have to have to live in some area. So not to get too real worldy with all of that. Uh, you know, obviously that can create a little bit of friction uh, depending on who's at your table and how you guys like to play. Use it, uh, use it carefully. So now that we have some city districts, uh, the next couple of tables, if I remember, yeah. So here we get into um, the types of businesses, the uh, types of buildings, religious areas, things like that. Um, I'm going to skip past a few of these. I'm going to get into some of the news and rumors, faction wars, uh, and a couple of abstract city encounters that we can throw into our cities. 
uh, just so we can keep moving forward, because this is only the second of the environments that, uh, that we rolled up on our random tables, and there's a ton of stuff that we could put in here. So flipping back up to the latest news, I'm gonna roll. Um, I'm gonna roll a d4 and see how many uh, news or rumors there might be uh, that sort of get easily floated around in this city. And the news and rumors that we've come up with for City One: religious zealotry is reaching the point of violence and inquisition at some temple or other religious authority. A faction war has broken out. And there's a second table that uh, I'll roll on in a second here to see who might be at war. Uh, members of a particular species, bloodline, ancestry, etc. are being rounded up by the city guard. And the fourth one, strangers are lurking in disguise within the city. Maybe, those, maybe some of those are true, maybe they're not. Uh, but for city number two, we ended up with the news and rumors. Uh, a surge of conversions to some deity is taking place. A war between nearby nobles outside the city has just broken out. And members of a particular species, bloodline, etc. are being rounded up by the city guard. So, if these two locations are close enough together, or they're somehow under a similar influence, maybe that, sec that, uh, that last rumor is true in both places. Maybe there are groups of people who are being rounded up by the city guard. Uh, so those are news and rumors. I'm going to roll on the Faction Wars and see who is at war in City 1. And so we've got two noble houses at war. So that kind of ties in both of these two uh, city locations have a similar idea that there is a war between a couple of noble houses. Now we're going to get into some abstract city encounter generation. Here I'm going to roll uh, maybe just two of these for each of the cities, just to come up with a couple of random things, uh, and then we'll go from there. And the city encounters that we've come up with uh, for City A, the first type of encounter is adventurers or armed bands, including city guard, uh, are having da a dangerous encounter with other people nearby, and it's based on some unexpected event. Uh, it happened just now. Uh, so. We'll have to put some more thought into what is that unexpected event that has uh, catalyzed in a uh, the guards or an adventuring band or something like that uh, coming to uh, you know a dangerous encounter with other people nearby. The second uh, city encounter: craftsmen, tradespeople, or guild members want to interact with the party based on beliefs, religion, or politics. Maybe they're trying to get the party to agree with, uh, you know, some some sort of religion or uh, side with some uh, some faction in a political battle or something like that. Uh, and maybe maybe depending on how that encounter uh, plays out, maybe that will also determine how the players or how the characters rather are treated while they're in this city. Maybe they have to pay higher fees when they go to a certain shop or to an inn or something like that. Maybe they're looked on more favorably or less favorably, stuff like that. Uh, so there could be interesting things that come out of that. Uh, for city number two, the city encounters that we come up with is, uh, the first one is adventurers or armed bands are acting strangely or having an uncharacteristic response to things based on a person who is present or whose influence affects the action of the individuals in the encounter. Uh, then the second encounter that we have is a performer or street vendor is carrying something interesting and it's based on or involves a past event. So maybe uh, maybe this ties into uh, player character backgrounds. Maybe someone sees um, a street vendor or a performer or something who is wearing a hat that either closely resembles the uh, the hat that someone's brother used to wear, or father, or mother. Maybe they have certain flowers or something like that. Maybe the flowers that they're carrying are related to a fortune uh, that a fortune teller uh, gave one of the one of the player characters. You know, something like that. Uh, there are a bunch of additional tables that are associated with our cities. Uh, so law and order, how are crimes handled, things like that. 
uh, types of prisons, um, Inquisition effects on hirelings and NPCs, um, and then uh, some religious uh, communities and influence within uh, these towns. Uh, there are a whole bunch of things. Temple types. Uh, why is the why is this place uh, sanctified or why is it holy? Administrative functions of larger temples, nature of relics, temple structures, um, and then some other stuff in here. Cultural changes in a city. Um, bill of fare so talking about um sort of what do different uh groups of people lower class middle class and upper class what are, what do they eat uh stuff like that now we're going to take a look at aerial adventure so up first we have locations and objectives so i'll roll twice on this table so the two locations that we've come up with in our aerial adventures are the top of a high spire or tower and then the second one is floating islands. Now we'll take a look at aerial problems and mysteries or missions. And the problems and mysteries that uh, rolled up are to either steal or recover something known to be in an aerial structure, bypass ground-based enemies to reach objective or adventure location, reconnoiter the best course of action or the best course for ground travel rather, uh, or stop or engage in snatching people by air. So those are four problems or mysteries uh, or missions uh, that we might uh, embark on in our aerial adventures. Next, we have events in the air, and these uh, this table, uh, there's a note here that's sort of pointing out this isn't just an encounter table. An encounter table would have to have a higher likelihood of random birds flying around, things like that, the normal stuff. Uh, this is for major events. Uh, major things that are going to be happening during your aerial adventure. So I'm going to roll up twice on here and see what we come up with. And the events that we come up with are a close swinging moon and floating vegetation. Close swinging moon sounds like a pretty substantial event. Uh, and floating vegetation, there could be some mystery around it or uh, maybe even just an opportunity to learn about some other uh, some other options for farming. Now we have things seen from the air. Uh, so I'll roll up twice on here just to get some fun stuff. So the random rolls uh, end up with things seen from the air are billowing smoke and a person fleeing uh, or a fleeing person. Those could be related. Maybe the uh, billowing smoke uh, that we see from the air is related to some of the things we rolled up in the city tables earlier, like the nobles uh, who are at war. Maybe uh, one of their buildings is being burnt down, uh, and so the, uh, the party is able to see some of the evidence from that. Then we get into some tables related to flying vehicles and structures, which are results on earlier tables, so I'm not going to worry about rolling on these as well as the owner of a flying structure or vehicle, purpose of the flying structure, uh, stuff like that. Um, that is pretty much it for Ariel, because that, uh, that next part uh, gets us into castles and ruins, which is not one of the random locations uh, or settings, environments, that, uh, that we rolled up. So let's find the tables for planar and alternate worlds. And here is our series of tables for planar adventures with some notes about planar adventures uh, can be a little bit difficult to design because the idea behind having additional planes of existence is that there has to be something different. It can't just have the same features as the prime material plane. There has to be something different about it. It has to feel unique and strange. Um, we could of course, uh, set this uh, on any of the planes that uh, that are outlined, uh, the inner and outer planes that are outlined in various manuals. Or in this case, we're going to roll up some random variations on a plane. And this could be sort of a subdomain, uh, if you think about it in the terms of like a Ravenloft uh, type of setting. Uh, the domains of dread are, are kind of um, isolated little pocket dimensions where uh, where things are not normal. So maybe these are similar. Maybe uh, these are subplanes where maybe there's a strange gravity. Maybe there the time is different there. Things like that. So I'm going to get to rolling up on these tables and we'll take a, take a look at what I come up with. 
And for the first table, what we've come up with, uh, what's different about this plane compared to the prime material plane? So uh, item one, there's a changed method of acquiring experience points. Not a big fan of that one because um, I don't like tracking experience points. I usually just do milestone achievements. Um, so maybe, maybe I don't use that one. Item number two, what's different? Dependable sanity of characters. So this can be a little bit tricky to play, but maybe uh, maybe um, rolling on um, rolling will saves or something like that to sort of make sense of things or to trust what they're seeing or not seeing. Something like that. Um, number three, the need for other additional or substitute basic necessities as opposed to the standard air, food, water, sleep, shelter. Uh, so there's some other resource that they have to have access to. Uh, so that could be interesting. Um, next, the types of planar adventures. Uh, so next, uh, there are a series of tables. Um, I'm going to count them up and then roll uh, twice to see which of these tables I'm going to roll on for uh, some random planar adventure types. All right, so there are seven different planar adventure types. So I'm going to roll a d8. If I end up with an eight, I'll roll again. Uh, I'll come up with two different uh, planar adventure types and then uh, see what maybe roll up two, um, two factors uh, for each of those. All right, so we ended up with uh, the two type of planar adventures. We have Dream Realms and Chthonic Planes. So in the Dream Realms, uh, shape-shifting into a particular uh, totem animal uh, is one of the uh, adventures that we have to embark on. And then um, the idea that movement rate is more or less affected by the amount of equipment carried than on the prime material plane. So things either become heavier or lighter or something like that. On the Chthonic Plains, uh, we have mutating terrain, so forests periodically change to swamps, hills rise, things like that. And on Chthonic Plains, uh, the, uh, the basic idea is that it's supposed to be hard to understand what's going on. It's supposed to be non-Euclidean geometry, things like that, that just sort of, from a prime material perspective, it's very challenging to understand what's going on in these, uh, these areas. Uh, and then there's an alteration to the initiative method, uh, so time doesn't act the way that it does on the prime material plane. And the other tables that are in this uh, section, there are some additional flavors for you know what what's happening, what what sort of features are present on these planes. So we have rivers and lakes in other planes, particularly Thonic or Dream Realms. Uh, mountains on other planes, again, Chthonic or Dream Realms. Uh, since we have both of those, I'm going to roll uh, a couple of times on there. And then we also have planar gateways. So understanding how to get to and from these, these planes, that's basically what this is for. So I'm going to roll up the additional features and the gateways. For our Dream Realms, we have rivers and lakes that are liquid aging. So if a character steps into uh, a river or a lake, uh, they get older. The mountains are intelligent, able to communicate, possibly hostile or friendly. Uh, so that opens up kind of a fun, uh, fun bit of play. And then gateways, I just rolled up one gateway for each of these planes. Uh, so touching a physical item such as a magical tree, ancient statue, or etc. Um, and then that's how you are teleported or transported to that new plane. And having used this particular gate as opposed to another gate leaves a visible, visible mark or aura on the character in the other plane. Uh, so they are, they're sort of tagged like a like fairy fire or something. Um, so it could be that this is a superior or an inferior gate, or perhaps using this gate signifies that the player characters belong to some sort of faction uh, that could be looked on favorably or infavorably. Uh, then for the Chthonic Plains, the uh, rivers and lakes are liquid sound. Um, the mountains are like jello. And the gateway uh, that I rolled up here is a, uh, the physical gateway is a um, travel is accomplished via some sort of vehicle. Uh, and there's no other 
particular aspect of the gateway. Uh, so th that uh, covers our planar adventures. So not quite as many subtables to roll here as obviously the uh, the cities uh, uh, section, but gives some interesting ideas for how to how to come up with an environment that's going to be a little bit weird uh, for for characters to travel into. Next, we have wilderness encounters or uh, wilderness uh, environments. So I'm going to find those tables and we'll get rolling up on those tables. For the wilderness adventures, we have a ton of tables uh, that take us through unusual trees, unusual plants, unusual features of animals. Uh, if there is a wounded animal or a dead animal, something like that, uh, what are you know some of what are the what are the features of that uh, that animal? What are the wounds like? Weird terrain features, caravans and cargo uh, that may be passing through the area. We have, uh, again, some more of the cargo, small cargo, magical, desert wilderness tables. So understanding, like, maybe this area isn't just trees. Maybe it's, uh, you know, sand and uh, other stuff. Uh, what do we have? Building interesting oasis, desert dressings, unusual sands, desert animals, stuff like that. Mapping forest features, forest dressing. Uh, forest legends, so um, understanding you know, what, what are some of the uh, legends, what are some of the tales about this, uh, this wilderness setting. Forest animals, jungle rainforest, um, hills and mountains, fossils, unusual cliff sides, swamps, um, swamp dressings, so tons of tables in there. I'm not going to detail those. I'm not going to go through those. Uh, I think we've we've got enough variation with uh, with our other uh, adventure area types. Maybe at a later date I'll come back and repopulate uh, some of the wilderness stuff, but um, I'm excited to sort of take all of these random ideas that uh, that have been created over the last couple of videos and start putting them together in one idea. Um, in my Google document here, I think we're up to 16 pages, something like that, uh, of all of the ideas that, uh, that, that have come out of these random roles. So there's a great deal of work that I have to do now, uh, to start putting things together. Maybe it's not a great deal of work. Maybe it's actually going to be real easy. We'll see. So, uh, hopefully that was interesting. Um, this is chapter four of the Tome of Adventure Design all about non-dungeon encounters or non-dungeon adventures. Um, take a look in the description box down below. There will be a link to Drive Through RPG as well as to Mythmir Games where you can purchase the Tome of Adventure designed by Matt Finch. If you would like to check out the other videos in this series, they'll be linked uh, somewhere around the screen up here. Stay tuned for more videos where I now take these ideas and put them into a cohesive adventure and start mapping things out, putting some stat blocks in place, stuff like that. Hit like and subscribe. I appreciate that. I appreciate you. And until next time, roll well, my friends.